I'm Sally Bagshaw. I am your Seattle City Council member for District 7. Mirabella is in District 7. Thank you for coming. Well, I'm very pleased to see you. And before we get started, I want to say thank you to Mirabella for sponsoring this. Uh, thank you so much for all of you who I have met before. It's really a pleasure to be back here. And I know I've told you this for the, this is my ninth year on Seattle City Council, that Mirabella is a place where I come because you vote, you have good opinions, you've got great ideas, and certainly you've got involvement. And I'm just so thankful to see so many of you here today. We're going to be talking about social and civic engagement. Um, I will tell you, there's a term up here that I do not like, Older Americans Month. None of us feel like we're older. Um, so nonetheless, that is the national term. So you'll hear me say that periodically. Forgive me. If we come up with a better term today, we'll just use that. But I'm going to share with you today, among some of my colleagues who are here, what's going well in the city of Seattle um, for those of us who are have grown up here and are still growing here. And then towards the end of this meeting, I'm going to ask to hear from you. We'll have mics that can uh, rotate or, uh, throughout the crowd. We'll also have uh, five by seven or three by five cards. If you have a question, you prefer to put your question on the card, so we'll answer. And I've already had multiple questions from my friends about the head tax, what's going on with homelessness. And I said, I will, after this is over, I will stay and talk to anybody who wants to talk about that. Um, but I don't want to talk about it now or we'll never get off that topic. So thank you very much again. Um, and this, today's event is around civic engagement. Um, and many of you know about age-friendly Seattle. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more, but I want to have Irene Stewart, who is the hero from the city. If you would just stand up so they know you're here. Um, so Irene Stewart has been leading the charge. I'm going to talk a little bit off script here for a moment about age-friendly Seattle. And I also want you to recognize that Seattle's channel is here. Thank you so much to our Seattle channel for recording this today, and we will have this up on my website and Age Friendly Seattle uh, website because this is really important. What we do here today is going to be, again, a model for some of the things that are coming. And Age Friendly Seattle became f visible to me about two years ago. Our then mayor um, was one of the cities, and I think we were the 130th city to become one um, around our nation. And it is a, a a joint effort between AARP and the World Health Organization with the goal of making those of us who are in our 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s actually have a place where we can live, where we feel comfortable about living, where all of the issues that we need around housing and transportation, just continued engagement and involvement with our city, where we can use the brain power and the experience that we have gained to continue to contribute and at the same time be respected for the work that we've done. Now, I will tell you that once we became one of these age-friendly cities, I got invited back to Washington, D.C. to meet with the big AARP office um, and many others because Seattle is in, in some ways being way out front, and I'll tell you a little bit more about some things that are happening, but we're using our tech industry. We are using people's experience and expertise to make sure that as a city that we are taking care of everybody, whether they're really little or whether they are more experienced like the rest of us in this room. And what I've been saying around transportation as an example, if we think about making our sidewalks better, if we think about making crosswalks easier. Now, it may be easier for all of us. It's also easier for a mom with a stroller. It's easier for an eight-year-old who's learning to ride her bike. So this isn't about trying to make the city something that is just for one population. It's for all of us. And that's what's exciting to me about Age Friendly. I also want to recognize Brent. Um, I arrived here outside on my bicycle. I am literally the poster child for Cascade Bicycle Club. Because you talk about all ages and abilities, um, I love riding my e-bike. And I can get here faster um, than I can by car or bus. And so, again, having places that are safe and separated, whether we're pedestrian, whether we're riding our bike, whether we're driving our car, that's part of age friendly. So I want to get back now on script uh, to talk about why we are doing this. And 
we have really done a lot of research around what keeps us healthy and happy besides eating well and doing the preventative things that our doctors tell us to do. One of the most critical aspects around age friendly is social inclusion. And you can talk with anybody. If they feel left out, they don't feel very good. And if we know around seniors who feel isolated that depression sets in, and many of you have probably seen that with some of your colleagues. That notion of being physically, physically, keeping physically active and at the same time socially included really matters. And um, I'm going to cite a study that Irene gave me, which I thought it was, it was pretty good, is that those who are socially isolated can have, that isolation can have more dire effect on individuals than if they were smoking nearly a pack of cigarettes a day. Now, nobody's suggesting you take up smoking. Um, the goal here is to make sure that we're all included and that we're able to connect with others. And I want to say, Carol Froman is here. Carol, in your, your red pants, if you're just, or your, if, your jacket. If you'll just say hello, stand up and wave. She is um, one of my longtime friends. She's in West Seattle, and she works now, I think, like you said, on the board of the West Seattle Senior Center. So one of the things that I have found with our senior centers in the years that I've been working uh, is that we don't, we don't do enough with or for the senior centers. Because I think sometimes, once again, people think, oh, I'm not a senior. I'm not going. The whole, idea, the whole point here is to figure out how we can include our seniors, our young people in, in a city where people feel really good about being here in this city. So it's a public benefit that all of us are figuring out ways to stay included. So today as we're talking about age friendly um, and this Older Americans Month, and I again, I apologize for that. Uh, it's interesting that every May since 1963, when John F. Kennedy was our president, we have celebra celebrated Older Americans Month. How many of you knew that? I know me either. You know, I, I mean, this is kind of news, new news. But I think what we have done uh, as age friendly, but also all of us in this room, we're making we're making noise. We are standing up and showing the experience and expertise we have, and. With that, I have several people that I am going to acknowledge. Now, many of you know one man in particular who is here from Mirabella. But first, let me just, um, who are we giving this proclamation to, Irene, the age friendly? The first one's just general. Okay, well, who, with, to whom may I direct this? I'm, how about if I just choose Louise Miller because she's here. Louise Miller, who's a former legislator, um, a friend here in Mirabella, I have worked with her on environmental issues, on arts issues, and she's now being extraordinarily helpful with the opera. So I'm about to give a proclamation. I'm going to hand it to you and you can figure out somewhere in Mirabella where you'd like to put this. So this is the proclamation from the city of Seattle signed by the mayor and the council members that Seattle is home to more than 207,000 residents age 50 or older who enrich and strengthen our community. And we have a resolution that we passed unanimously a year ago that formalized the city of Seattle's commitment to become a more age-friendly city. I will tell you that I was pleased that all of my colleagues supported that but I drove it just because I think it is so critical and that we just keep being out in front of this. So Seattle is committed to engaging and supporting older adults. I'm skipping a few whereas's to end up with now therefore the mayor of Seattle and the Seattle City Council do proclaim May 2018th as Older Americans Month. Thank you for um, doing whatever is needed to put that out and let people know that we truly appreciate Mirabella. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Poor Louise, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate that. But I'm now going to recognize three very special people. Um, and these are individuals that are making a difference um, in, in our community. And the first is Reverend Mary Diggs Hobson. And um, she didn't know that she was going to be selected for this, but I'd love it. Can you walk up here on the stage comfortably? Great, thank you. So Reverend Diggs Hobson is someone whose work that many of us in the city have admired for a long time. And um, I think you're going to have to talk a little bit more about this and if you're comfortable about the health issues that you have experienced with your son and what you have done. But she has been leading uh, African American Reach and Teach Health Ministry. Right. And I appreciate that. So 
I'm going to read the proclamation, if I may, and then ask you to say a few words about your work. Okay. Thank you. So this is whereas Mary is an, May is National Older Americans Month, and the 2018 theme is Engage at Any Age. And among more than 200,000 Seattle residents who are age 50 or older, there are some shining examples of older adults who continue to make a difference in their communities. And one such individual is our Reverend Mary Diggs Hobson, who is on a personal mission to eliminate health disparities experienced by African American communities. And just a quick side note, those of us who are working in the city know that health disparities range in zip codes, shockingly, so that people in some of uh, the southeast Seattle are most affected, whether it's pollution or just simply quality of air um, and life in that, in that area. So Reverend Diggs Hobson and her son, the late Reverend Reginald Diggs, were moved to co-found the African American Reach and Teach Health Ministry um, due to his experience with chronic kidney and heart disease and HIV AIDS. And whereas for 10 years as executive director of AARTH, Reverend Diggs Hobson built partnerships with health clinicians, community service providers, and faith-based organizations in four states. And Reverend Diggs Hobson helped faith community leaders, health professionals, and volunteers listen to community needs and share important healthcare information by meeting people where they are and those who received training were effective in disseminating culturally competent information about HIV AIDS care and in teaching chronic disease self-management skills. And whereas Reverend Diggs Hobson recently retired, but the model she developed to empower others continues on. Now, therefore, the mayor of Seattle and the Seattle City Council recognize Reverend Mary Diggs Hobson for dedicating your life to inspiring and empowering others to improve the health of people of African descent now and for generations to come. Thank you so much, and I'm gonna hand you the microphone. Thank you, Councilmember Backshaw. I'm not sure what else I can say after all of this, um, but our organization, uh, we have been in, in uh, operation since 2002 and it was co-founded by my son, Reginald, who has passed on, and myself. Um, the disparities, as, as most of you know, are great among communities of color, and uh, particularly among African Americans. And the work that we do, uh, when I say we, uh, we do have a small staff, and I was hoping that a couple would be here today because when it comes to the work around um, education and training for the chronic diseases such as uh, diabetes and uh, chronic pain, as well as uh, those who are survivors of cancer and HIV. Um, our staff, are they're the ones who are out there doing the work. Uh, Jessica Williams and Sonora Dean and uh, Linda Chasteen. And so we work do work across the, the, the county and the state. Um, with uh, delivering the living well with chronic conditions, which is also uh, uh, one of our funders is through uh, the HSD, the Human Service Department, Aging and Disabilities, of which we are so much appreciative of, and Washington State Department of Health. And um, that work takes us into clinics, as well as organizations that are providing services, and in different churches as, and other faith, faith institutions, so that we are not only reaching African Americans, but we're reaching many who are coming from other communities of color. And as far as aging, engaging, and, um, and age, um, yes, I'm 71, and I'm still quite active, and we want uh, all of those of us who are gracefully moving on in our age to be active and healthy, to live well and to live healthy. Thank you. Thank you. And when did you get started on your, this, this organization? You said you're 71 now, so mm -hmm. at what age did you start this? Um, let me see. Now I won't do it. I just asked her, I'm so impressed. She just said that she's 71 years old, and I asked her, at what point in your career did you start this organization? Okay, so I, we started the organization in 2002. Sorry, we started the organization in 2002. I'll let you do the math. Um, <laughs> okay. Very good. Yes, but it's probably, it's about my fourth, it was my fourth career. 
so to speak. I'm a huge fan of fourth careers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene. Very nice. The next person that we're going to be honoring is June Michelle. And June um, is an individual that I have known about, even though today is the first time that we've met. Come on up. This is great. Um, she's a civil rights attorney who, during her career, has focused on women's rights, employment, equality, and protection of older adults. And I'm reading a proclamation here that she was an early champion of workforce diversity, both as a trial lawyer and lady, later as an affirmative action manager. And whereas June mentors students who are considering a legal career, and she continues to use her analytical and advocacy skills as an aging services network advocate, serving on the Seattle King County Advisory Council on Aging and Disability Services. And whereas June is a Latina who lives in the International District and volunteers at Wing Luke Museum, which promotes the Asian Pacific American experience, and whereas she was instrumental in seeking aging and disability services project support for the Japanese American Remembrance Trail. Thank you. An urban hike from Seattle's Pioneer Square through Chinatown International District to the Central District. Now, therefore, the mayor of Seattle and Seattle City Council recognize June Michelle as an effective advocate for older adults, individuals with disabilities, people with memory loss, and multi multicultural communities throughout our region, and an outstanding social and civic engagement role model for others, young and old. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I'm impressed with all that. <laughs> I am a civil rights lawyer. I have been for many years, and I have, I have done many, many different things. I have to say the most wonderful thing I have been doing recently is representing the people in Seattle, in Washington. And, you know, we are so far ahead of, of so many cities. We really, really, really care about our people. But I just got back from Washington, D.C., and there's a lot of work to be done still. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So the third person we're going to recognize today in alphabetical order, I would like to point out, is my buddy John Pearson. And for those of you who are in Mirabella, you know about this man. He and I first met about 15, 16 years ago when he was creating the vision for the Bell Street Parkway. And since, there, since that time, and I was in the prosecuting attorney's office at that time, but working on the Waterfront for All project, since that time, I have had the pleasure of being with this individual who has come to city council, and we recognize him as such a scholar, as somebody who does his homework, that we have brought him up to our council table to be there, to be able to ask him questions, whether it's about the little Seattle Times Park across the street, or now market to Mohai, and making sure that the construction of the building across the street has at least some pedestrian, um, well, let's say some improvements over the existing design. Um, John, I just have such tremendous respect for you and appreciate what you've done, and we have a proclamation for you as well, if I can read this. So I'm just jumping in the middle because you all have heard the preambles now, that one special individual is John Pearson, a resident of Mirabella, Seattle, which is hosting our Older Americans Month event on May 4th, that's today. And whereas John served several terms on the City of Seattle's Families and Education Levy Oversight Committee and has participated in countless other civic events, and as an 18-year resident of downtown Seattle, John has been an active member of neighborhood councils in Belltown and South Lake Union. And whereas more than 20 years into retirement, John instigated Market to Mohai, a plan to develop an urban pedestrian trail linking downtown Seattle's Pike Place Market with South Lake Union's Museum of History and Industry. And boy, is he doing that. He wrangled $500,000 out of the city last year. Um, who could do that but John Pearson? At age 91, John remains committed to enhancing the vibrancy of Belltown, Denny Triangle, and South Lake Union. And whereas John maintains a laser focus 
on identifying the resources needed to provide visual identity and age and disability friendly lighting, seating and other pedestrian amenities to the project. Now therefore, the Mayor of Seattle and Seattle City Council recognize John Pearson as a mover and a shaker in Seattle who serves as a social and civic engagement role model for others young and old. Thank you, John. <laughs> You're moving great. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to be a hero in your hometown. <laughs> my hero. Uh, you know, who should be recognized as Sally, but I'll say just a few words about Marka Tomohai while I have the podium here. Uh, we're trying to build a pedestrian pathway or corridor from someplace important called Pike Place Market through some places important called Belltown, Denny Triangle, and South Lake Union, to Lake Union and Mohai. And it should be safe, comfortable, well-lit, and engaging. And, um, you know, it, 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 if pretty easy to look at it and say, if you make it safe and comfortable and for, for aging people, uh, it'll be good for everybody. And so we're not building it for visitors, we're building it for the people who live, work, and play here. And uh, thank you so much, uh, and uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, John. In all seriousness, it's just such a pleasure to work with John. And I am grateful that he has brought so many of you to the table many times and to meetings that we've had upstairs. So congratulations and you so well deserve this recognition. So next I am going to invite Kathy Knight and Brent Butler up to the stage if you are ready. Um, these two have been working really on this age-friendly effort now. Uh, Brent is new to me. I just, I met him today with his bicycle helmet in hand. I, I hailed a fellow bicycle rider. Um, Kathy Knight working closely with Irene Stewart. Um, it, this really matters that we've got people in the city that are committed to this work. Kathy directs the Aging and Disability Services Division of our Human Services Department, and Brent is the new Program Manager for Age-Friendly Seattle. Um, and this is an initiative that, as I mentioned earlier, that we launched over a year and a half ago. So since that launch, and, and I want to recognize Irene Stewart here again, we've done some pretty innovative things. Um, the civic tech, she did a civic technology hackathon. That sounds like a, a bad thing when we talk about or think about other countries hacking into our um, electronic and IT systems that we have. But a hackathon is a design where people that have experience come together and share those experiences and come up with new ideas. And then we had um, a 200-person a, a event that was focused on equity. And that included women and economic security, ways to reduce social isolation, ways to take the stigma off of public housing options, and then continuing to promote people's employment after 50, 60, 70, 80 with experiences that we have that we can bring to bear. Um, and I also want to recognize much of the work and some folks that I talked to back here that are involved in the Grandmothers Against Gun Violence that, you know, there are so many things that are being done in our city, but it's using the experiences and expertise we have to solve some of the problems that I appreciate so much. Um, so I'm going to pass this on, Kathy, to you, um, and you can explore and tell us how every issue is an aging issue. Thank you very much. I'm really thrilled to be here today representing the City of Seattle Human Services Department. And um, as Sally said, I'm the Director of the Aging and Disability Services Division. And Brent and I are here today to just quickly introduce you to Age Friendly Seattle and to also let you know let you know what we've done and what comes next. All right, so I gotta work. 
As Sally said, um, City of Seattle joined the AARP network of age-friendly communities in 2016. And age-friendly is actually an aspirational designation. It's something, it's a continuous improvement effort. It's something that we will be working for, working on now, working in the future. So the staff at um, Aging and Disability Services, under Irene's leadership, spent more than a year assessing Seattle's age friendliness, raising visibility about aging issues, developing strategies to make Seattle more age friendly, and writing an action plan for 2018 to 2021. So we engaged with city departments, with external stakeholders, and, we, and consumers and community members around the city and the region. We built on city plans, policies, and initiatives. We used population data, consumer surveys, and best practices from other communities. And our process included two equity forms that Sally mentioned. We had one focused on age, uh, um, LGBT aging, and we had one on the unique needs of older women. And then we also had the Civic Technology Hackathon that developed both low and high tech solutions to common problems like community mobility, communication, and information. And throughout all this, we engaged more than about 1,500 people And we developed 88 strategies that are, we're starting to implement those strategies, that we'll be continually evaluating those strategies, and we're looking for opportunities and additional resources to be able to implement that. And, and you may have ideas for us today. We use the World Health Organization eight domains uh, in developing the action plan. These are eight domains of livability, and this is the basis for the AARP age-friendly communities. So these are areas where cities can help people of all ages to live with ease, in comfort, and in community. Where there are, of the eight domains, there are three that we consider the built environment, and those relate to transportation, housing, outdoor spaces, and buildings. Five of the eight domains, those that are kind of the lime green, is this like a Seahawks thing? <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> um, relate to social, the social environment. That includes community support and health services. That's much of what we do at Aging and Disability Services. Communication and information, respect and social inclusion, and social participation and civic engagement. And that's what we're here to really talk about today. So what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Brent, and he's going to go through those eight domains just a little, little more with you. Age-friendly Seattle. I'm going to hold it up a little. It'll be great. And uh, age-friendly Seattle really supports safe, reliable, easy travel options. And I, I just want to point out that Sally mentioned that she saw me with my bicycle helmet. And part of that is that we recognize that the physical environment, the built environment, if it's conducive for all ages and abilities to get around, to get to where they need to go, it also improves your health. And uh, I hit 55 just recently, and I recognize that uh, the guidelines are that I need to get about 30 minutes of exercise a day. And so if I can sort of factor that in through how I get around, I'm actually going to be marching towards a healthier lifestyle. So through our age-friendly program, we have focused on affordable public transit. How many people here use public transit? Great, great. Critically important, we're finding, from many of the older adults that we talk with. We're also looking at ride share, walking, and as I indicated, uh, how I got here, um, how I try to get around on a regular basis, uh, biking. And uh, one of the um, interfaces that's really important is an age-friendly street design. Now, many of you have seen how uh, the city has been uh, proactive in making sure that there are ramps, that people can cross streets. And we're looking at how we can ensure that where there are a large uh, quantity of older adults, that it is conducive to get around. Last year, in fact, um, the Seattle Department of Transportation 
walked and assessed 2,300 miles of sidewalks, recording every flaw, and most importantly, developed a street design toolkit for age-friendly neighborhoods, collaborated on curb ramp and waterfront access accessibility, and promoted, most importantly, pedestrian safety for all. So I wanted to point out that most of us want to age in place. In fact, uh, my mother has lived in the same house my entire life. Uh, when I was uh, born, I have only known that house, and my mother has always been in that bedroom. And that seems to be a trend we recognize. We, through surveys, have recognized that many older adults, large majorities, wish to remain in our, in our homes and communities. Age-Friendly Seattle promotes housing options that are affordable, designed for access, and safe. So all ages and incomes can live with independence and dignity. Last year, Age-Friendly Seattle collaborated with community-based organizations to study senior housing needs. On an ongoing basis, we collaborate with other agencies to promote the, the uh, it's really important uh, state senior property tax exemption program. As, have you all heard of that? I just want to see by a raise of your hands how many you have. So we need to get the word out. It's really important. Our utility discount program. Have you heard of the utility discount program? Great. And then, importantly, our home repair and weatherization programs. We've also recognized that certain communities have significant issues with foreclosure. So we've also looked at uh, foreclosure prevention services. It's very important. Um, many of you have probably have heard the term of predatory lending. So we want to make sure that we are addressing our community's needs. Age Friendly Seattle is helping architects, designers, builders, remodelers, homeowners learn about what we call universal design principles. That's what makes our homes and our buildings safe and visitable by all people of all ages and abilities. Some of the features of universal design include level entries, a wide doorway. I, I, I will never forget visiting a very good friend of mine who had a stroke, and he required a wheelchair. Um, when he got the wheelchair, it became apparent that he couldn't use the wheelchair to get into the bathroom. It wasn't wide enough. Universal design tackles challenges like that. Another component is once you get into the bathroom, you have to have a sufficient turning radius for the wheelchair. Um, also, that turning radius is important in your kitchens and in the bathrooms. So those are some of the key principles that we're focusing on with universal design. Seattle has amazing parks, passive green space, active recreation. And we have a number of indoor and outdoor formal and informal meeting places. This is vital to our well-being. Age-Friendly Seattle supports coordination and promotion of community, health care, and human services, meeting the needs of children, youth, older adults and caregivers. And we've heard from you that intergenerational opportunities are important. Helping all to live healthy, fully, and with dignity. People receive information in a variety, a variety of ways. And no one way reaches every person. In our communication and information domain, we promote, among other things, age-friendly print, accessible digital communications, 
accessible venues, assistive technologies that support access to information programs and services for all people. These are all very important in ensuring that we have the adequate social participation and physical activity that are essential for both the quality of life and longevity. Age-Friendly Seattle supports learning, fitness, social, cultural, spiritual activities for older adults, intergenerational activities, as I stated, and activities that are accessible, safe, and fun. Today, you will hear about the Seattle parks and uh, recreation programs for people age 50 plus, and I just reached that mark about five years ago. <laughs> Several photos shown here are of, our, of their uh, lifelong uh, recreation program. Others are from programs at several of our incredible senior centers, and I know we have a, uh, one of the directors here. Thank you. Everyone wants to feel valued. We believe in the wisdom and experience of all older adults, individuals with disabilities, and people with memory loss. And we believe that ageism and ableism, like racism and sexism, must be dismantled. And on this note, I, I have uh, personally been experiencing what that means. My, my mother is having cognitive loss, and uh, we, and I say we, my siblings, we're working to ensure that her quality of life continues as the cognitive loss progresses. And in fact, yesterday, uh, I, a few years ago, I've been always planning my mother's, uh, she loves uh, some of the colors of the of the flowers, so I planted some of them, and when I called her a couple of days ago, that's all she could talk about, that they're coming out right now. So these little things, the smelling of the, the roses, the, the, the visual, um, everyone wants to feel valued. And so we need to look and analyze what we can do to ensure that everyone is comfortable in their home, in their communities, and as they get around. Many people find value in contributing to their communities. Age-Friendly Seattle is developing strategies to help people connect to meaningful volunteer work, improve employer practices that support mature workers, and help businesses respond effectively to the needs of mature consumers. Now, in closing, I just wanted to make sure that you had a second opportunity to see our team. And I'm referring to the age-friendly team. And we're not all here, but a lot of us are. And you've seen um, uh, several of our members stand up. But there are others that are in the room that um, I'd also like to acknowledge. Uh, um, Sarah, Fahima, Irene, I saw Gigi, I see Karen. Why don't you please stand up? Just, uh, and Mary and Pat and Angela, and, Angela and, Maria. and Maria, thank you. Where is everybody? Please stand up. And Kathy <laughs> and Lori. <laughs> We encourage you to stay in touch with us, and I wanted to thank you. Um, but I want to acknowledge something that Brent just said. The last year of my dad's life, um, he came to Seattle to live with my husband and me, and we live in the Watermark Tower. Um, and my dad was a pretty amazing man, and he lived till he was 91 years old. And during the time that he was living with us, we had an absolute blast, um, and we were just really lucky to have him. Um, but one of the things that he used to say to me, and at that time I was still in the prosecuting attorney's office, uh, chief of the civil division, and we started an elder program. And this is when Norm Mailing was alive, he was my boss. But my dad used to say, as long as you've got your family and you've got some resources and you've retained your marbles, uh, I'm sorry, that, that's his words, um, he said, you're gonna be fine. But if you're missing any one of those things, 
then you're in trouble. And I just appreciate that so much. So as we're looking at age-friendly, what I'm interested in hearing from all of you, and we will get the microphone, we will get the cards out, these are the things that you can help us know better. What, what would you say on your experiences based with your families, with your friends, that we could be doing and should be doing better? So the next person that's going to speak is Sam Reed. Sam, where are you? Oh, good, thank you. Come on up. Sam is with our Department of Neighborhoods. And many of you know that Department of, Rav Rav Department of Neighborhoods started with Jim Deers um, about three decades ago. It's gone through another transformation, and I'm very respectful of whether, what they're trying to do differently, which is to reach people in different locations rather than assuming that you come to City Hall, that we and our neighborhoods, we're coming to you so we can hear directly from you. So Sam, I'm going to um, hand this microphone over to you. You can talk about how the department is engaging and connecting with people. Thank you very much. I just want to thank Councilmember Bagshaw and uh, the folks at Age Friendly Seattle and Mirabella for inviting us here today to talk about the work that we're doing. Um, and thank you all of you for showing up and, and hearing us out and listening to what we have to offer. So uh, like Councilmember Bagshaw said, I work for the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods. I'm on the communications team there. And I've been there for about two years. And our mantra at Seattle Department of Neighborhoods is really about strengthening Seattle by actively engaging all community members. Um, and we really take that very seriously. And we, we kind of approach that, achieving that mission in very, very different ways. Um, obviously, one is face-to-face -face, um, outreach and engagement all throughout the city. As Councilmember Bagshaw said, meeting people where they are and actively engaging them where they are instead of expecting them to always come to us. Um, it's through leadership development opportunities, training the next uh, wave of emerging leaders in terms of civic engagement and community building, funding opportunities to help neighborhoods and communities uh, improve their communities. Um, but as the communications team, one of our jobs, we really feel, is to make it as easy as possible for people to access information, make it easy to understand, make sure that everyone has the tools and resources they need to engage effectively and then also to actually help them organize their own communities to be more effective stewards of their communities and advocates for their communities. So as we were trying to tackle this work when I came on board two years ago, we did a big survey kind of just to get an idea of what people thought that the city could do better. Um, and so we, we put out some basic questions, but one of the main questions that we wanted to know is what is your big idea? What can the city do that would help all of us uh, have better communities, stronger communities, more effective government. And so we took that and we decided to build a suite of tools, one of which is this community resource hub, which I'm gonna show you. Um, and the main things we've got from that survey was that people really wanted, one, they wanted to understand what city government was saying. And what I, when I came on board, one of the things we joke about a lot in the office is that we also just need a translate. We, we see ourselves as the translators from government wonk to actual human speak. And the Department of Neighborhoods, that is what we really check everything to make sure, is this something, if we were just talking to someone on the street or talking to one of our relatives or our friends at a bar or a coffee shop, would they actually be able to understand what we're saying and be able to make sense of it and know what they could do to actually be a part of it? So that is a big thing that we think about a lot when we, we see ourselves, ourselves as kind of the hub for the city of Seattle and getting information out and making sure people can understand it and get plugged in. Um, so one of the things we wanted to tackle was, one, another thing we heard is that people wanted a easier access to information. Because the city of Depart Seattle has a lot of different departments. They all have their own websites. They all have their own outreach and engagement uh, teams that do things in their own way. So we wanted to provide what we called a one-stop shop. And not just online, but also in the way that we think about how we run our communications team. So we kind of took that old, uh, stole Fred Meyer's mantra, like what's on your list today, you'll find it at Fred Meyer. Um, so we kind of lived by that and said, how can we make it as easy as possible where people can just go to one place to get the information they need and then understand what they can do to actually take action if they want to take action. So one of the culminations of that is this community resource hub. Um, and so we developed this website um, to really function as that, at least in a virtual space, as that kind of resource for folks. And we built this over the course of a year, and it basically just consolidates a bunch of information from all over the city into one very easily accessible place that doesn't look like a government website. It's actually friendly and kind of fun looking. Um, that was very intentional. 
Um, so, and we kind of broke it down into different categories of what people need from what we've heard. Some people just need information. They need easy access to information. So one of the main buckets was really how do we just make sure that people are informed and have the information they need to make decisions or to do anything in their own community. And then beyond that, we wanted to make sure an another bucket was about how do people get connected and engaged, whether it is engaged with their own community, their own neighborhood, or in city government, city council, any kind of possible civic engagement. And then the last bucket we wanted to focus on, because we work a lot with community-based organizations throughout the city, and we fund many of those organizations as well, was how can we actually build a suite of tools and resources that will help people organize their own communities and prosper as community-based organizations. So that's kind of how we broke down the information. And I'm just gonna kind of go through the basics overview of the site and maybe click on a few of these so you can see what, uh, what things look like and get a kind of navigation of where we're going with this. Um, so obviously the first one, our newsletter. We, we've done a newsletter for years as many, many departments and many organizations do. When we decided to change course and really focus on this being this hub for the city, we also changed our newsletter completely and overhauled it. Um, it comes out every two weeks and it focuses not just on the programs and services of the Department of Neighborhoods, but on engagement opportunities and basic information that people need throughout the whole city, throughout city government, and also supporting the engagement work of community-based organizations throughout the city. Um, that public outreach and engagement calendar is something that we've been trying to coordinate and consolidate all the engagement opportunities which include public meetings, public hearings, meetings open for public comment, getting all departments to put this on one calendar so that everyone can access it in one space. Um, and that is an ongoing work that we're trying to wrangle all these departments to make sure that they do that. That is a big part of our job. Um, City Updates Hub is something that we're still working on, but it'll basically be one place where you can go to actually sign up for information in one centralized source based on issue, based on department, and you can subscribe to mailing lists to make sure that you get the information you need. Um, neighborhoods and Districts page is just a basic, you know, here are the council districts in the city, here's where your neighborhood is in which council district you're in, and we're also gonna be providing snapshots of different things so people can get more basic information about their neighborhood and who they contact if they wanna get plugged in or have information or questions. Um, one of the most popular, unsurprisingly, given all the stuff that's happening in our city, is our issues page, um, which really was meant to, you know, as communications people and as our community engagement coordinators on the Department of Neighborhood staff know, we hear a lot about the things that are happening in this city and what people are, care about, what they're having problems with, what they want answers about. So we decided to create a page, given all that information that we know and hear about so often, that really consolidates all this kind of on one page. If you have a problem with graffiti, if there's illegal dumping, if there's potholes, people are speeding on your street and you wanna talk about street calming, so putting all of this in one place so people could see where they need to go and have access to it in one easy location, and then they can go out from there, but at least this place gives them a direct spot where they can go to get that information. Because we all have issues. Um, and then one of the most robust things in each of these categories are these toolboxes that we've created. Um, and we tried to make these um, kind of break them down by categories. And the top one in, under Get Informed is really basic. It's, you know, know your city. And it runs the, uh, the gamut from just a newcomer's guide, where the customer service center is, how you can get basic information, how city government even works. Um, this video here that is in the top left is all about actually how our city government works and what the process is and who's involved. Um, down to how a bill becomes a law. Um, and then moving on into some of the things that Brent mentioned too is a, uh, a dedicated place devoted to free and discounted resources that it's amazing how many folks don't know what all the resources for free and discounted services that the city has to offer. So we've put uh, the most popular ones here in one place and then the mayor's office um, under this more resources down here at the bottom, they've actually, many of you have heard, have developed an affordability page that really is a I think there's over a hundred uh, discounts and services available on that page as well. 
Um, the next is tools and workshops. Workshops around the city from everything from how to be better stewards of, of water conservation, auto leaks workshops, Seattle tool libraries that are throughout the city. And the Seattle Public Library has a vast amount of workshops and classes that they offer on a regular basis. Um, community support resources. Um, Age-friendly Seattle is on there. Um, so we're just, and then the last one is on each of these pages, neighborhood safety. Um, and you'll see populated throughout these are also videos that we produce. This is a 911 video that we uh, produced and made available in nine different languages. But basically just providing the various information that people need regardless of the topic that they have and making it easy for them to understand how they can engage. Um, and if we move over to the engagement bucket, add your voice is one of the things that we have been working hard on and we're pretty proud of. We launched it in the fall of 2016. And it, it is basically a consolidated page that lists all the opportunities throughout the city and even the county for people to have public input. So anything that's open for public input, whether it's a survey, whether it's formal public input at a hearing, um, is, some, is stuff we list here. And we get this information from all the different city departments. And also we scour, do a lot of hunting and gathering for resources that are available throughout the whole county. And there's even some that are available statewide because they impact Seattle. Um, let me go back. Uh, Community Connector is another uh, online tool that we built, um, where, which basically serves as a kind of a one-stop shop if you want to find information about community organizations that are working, whether it's in a neighborhood that you live in or work in, or whether it's on a specific topic or issue. So it's a way for uh, it's a way for people to easily connect with those organizations, get the information they need about who's working on what. And then also, it's a great way for community-based organizations to connect with each other. And you can search by topic or neighborhood. It's all based in keywords. And this is all uh, uh, crowdsourced. So organizations come on here and they enter their own information. Um, so here I just typed in seniors. And it just pulls up all the different communities that are, or organizations that are working um, on that particular topic that listed that as one of their keywords or interest words. Um, and right now we have, I think, just over 200 organizations in here with plenty more to add as we continue to roll this out and make sure that the community-based organizations know about it as a tool and resource for them. And then on down to different ways that people can get engaged kind of at a deeper level, boards and links to boards and commissions and all the various, I think, over 70 boards and commissions that the city has that people can get involved with. Um, and then we have another toolbox down here as well that is focused primarily on how people can get involved and get engaged in local government, whether it's through some of the things that I've already mentioned our, uh, uh, or deeper into that leadership development through our pub, uh, People's Academy for Community Engagement or Community Liaison Program, um, on down to community improvements, actually getting to work in your community and making improvements happen by organizing your neighbors and finding the opportunities that you can, how the city can help you do that. And then more about community building and on down to neighborhood safety as it, as less information, but more about how people can organize or get engaged in their own community around the issues of neighborhood safety and the resources the city provides to help make that happen. And then over to our last bucket, which is get organized. You'll see that many of this, much as this is still coming soon because we're still working on a lot of the tools. Um, Space Finder is a, a program that actually is already up and running through the Office of Arts and Culture. Um, but basically, we're partnering with them to expand the reach of that to be service to community-based organizations outside of the arts and culture sector as well. So it's basically a venue, an online venue uh, directory where you can go and do a direct search if you're looking for a space to rent for your community organization to hold a meeting or if you're holding an event or anything. This is a place where you can easily find a venue, know where it is, how much it costs, who you can contact to get information about it. So it's just a great tool for community-based organizations to use to help them do what they need to do. Um, and the city is working on creating a uh, another one-stop shop grants portal. As many of you know, many different departments throughout the city have their own grants programs, and you have to go through all these various websites to access those different programs. 
the city right now is working on consolidating all of that so as there is a one to rule them all and make it a lot easier for people to actually apply and get involved and, and seek funding from the city. And that's still forthcoming and being worked on through the various departments and Seattle IT. Um, and then lastly, the organizing toolbox. So this is really looking at if you're interested in organizing your community, whether it's becoming a formal organization or just activating your neighbors around a particular issue or topic, um, there are tools and resources in here to help uh, residents do that. So basic documents about how to actually form an organization, what you can do to run a meeting, um, outreach and engagement tips that run the gamut from looking at incorporating a racial equity lens into the work you're doing as an organization, making, making your documents and your meetings more accessible, um, and then on down to funding sources if you're thinking about becoming a nonprofit, and then back to neighborhood safety as well as it relates to working for a community-based organization. Um, so I know I went through that pretty fast, but basically what we're trying to do is just make it as easy as possible for people to get plugged in and get the information they need and they don't have to go on this huge hunting and gathering search party to actually be able to answer a question or get the information they need or get engaged into the work of the government. And to make the face of the government and all the people that are working for the government much more accessible and friendly. Um, and to let you know we're here and we're listening and we do know how to talk human. Um, and so we're just finding ways and really taking that upon ourselves to be the mission of our department is really to be that liaison and that person coming to you to make sure that you know how to plug into government and you have the information you need. And one of the things you'll see it over here on the side, this uh, community resource guidebook is something we developed in, in, in tandem with this resource hub. And I brought copies with me today. It's hot off the press. We just got it to our office right before I left here for here. Um, but it basically takes the Community Resource Hub concept and puts it into a, uh, something that you can hold in your hands and take with you. Because I know not everyone is um, always plugged in online, and that's a good thing. So these are out in the lobby, and I have some more with me if we run out. If, if there aren't any more out there, just come find me. Um, and I'll be here towards the end as well to take questions if anyone has questions about any of the content up here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam Reed. Thank you to the Department of Neighborhoods. Um, there's been a, an extraordinary change in that department over the years, and I want to recognize that um, and appreciate the work you're doing. So many thanks. So the last formal part of our presentation is through our Parks and Recreation. I think we've got two of our Parks folks here. Do you want to come up? Cheryl Brown and Brenda Kramer. Uh, they work with Lifelong Recreation Program, and one of my favorites is Silver Sneakers. So we'll hear a little bit more about that, what you're doing, and how these are available for free, mostly, um, to people in our city. So thank you so much, Brenda. Any of you participated in a lifelong recreation program before? Raise yeah. of hands. A few of you have. All right, great. Thank you. So I was looking at your program title today, and I was happy to see that it is Engage at Every Age, because the first slide of our presentation, Cheryl, you want to make a yeah, okay. um, has a quote from our strategic marketing plan, which reads, some people are old at 18 and some people are young at 90. Time is a concept that humans created. That's a quote by Yoko Ono, and I thought it was really fitting with the title of your theme today. So we're up here to talk to you about what programs that we have at Seattle Parks and Recreation for people aged 50 and better. And um, we have programs that cover physical activity, social engagement, education, the arts, and just many ways of creating healthy lifestyles for people who are 50 and older. We actually program for a 50 year age span we have people who are in our programs who are in their hundreds. And so this is not like programming for teens, which is a 10-year span, but we actually have a 50-year span that we program for, which can get a little complicated because people's needs vary depending upon their, um, how in shape they are physically and whether people are socially isolated or not. So um, here you are to learn more about us. Okay, so um, as I just said, we have programs that cover fitness, 
environmental, art, social activities, and then we also have trips. So we go on day trips and overnight trips all around the Puget Sound area. And in addition, we have some signature programs. We have our Sound Steps program, which started in 2003. And so we, our goal is to get people out and walking. We have programs for every level. Um, for people who use mobility devices, we have um, walking programs both indoors and outdoors. Then we have our signature Sound Steps program, so people go for walks maybe once a week all over the city. We have um, groups that gather, they're, they're basically volunteer-led, and they go on a spring training program that culminates in walking a half marathon each year. And our oldest participant in the half marathon is 97, Betty. Um, we also have our food and fitness program, which began in 2004. And this program, we have three food and fitness programs right now. One for the Vietnamese community. They meet at Garfield Community Center twice a week. And the purpose of these programs is to create a safe and comfortable environment for people who share ethnicity in common, and they get together and have a place to gather to celebrate their ethnicity. They cook a congregate meal in our commercial kitchen and then have some form of physical activity. It could be singing karaoke, it could be playing ping pong, card games, dancing, um, so anyway, one program is at um, Garfield for Vietnamese. We have a second program at Miller Community Center for Koreans. And then we have a third program at Yesler Community Center for East Africans. And they just added a third day of the week at TILS um, new commercial facility in Rainier Valley. Our third program is, oh, that's hard to read, is Dementia Friendly Recreation. It started as a pilot program in 2011, and with the passage of the Metropolitan Parks District, we were enabled to get a half-time position to coordinate this program. This program is basically community-led. It relies on partnerships and a lot of volunteers and so they have gatherings all throughout the city. It could be arts programs, it could be dancing programs, um, arts in the parks, they do zoo walks, and one of the really nice things about this program is that caregivers are able to attend for free. Many of the programs that we offer are free to participants, some have a small fee, um, but it's nice that caregivers can come um, and help. Our last um, and latest program is Rainbow Recreation, and we are starting this program this year as a pilot. We don't have any funding for it, but we're, we're eking things out as slowly as we can, um, but this program is in response to demand from the LGBTQ community, so we've been offering classes, trips, and enhanced fitness classes for that community. So this is the first slide. We're just gonna go through some pictures and talk a little bit about what we do. But we ha serve a real diverse population. And these are just a couple of slides that I pulled out. The, on the far right there, I guess your far left, is a picture from our Korean Elders Program at Miller Community Center, one of our congregate meal programs. The picture down at the bottom is a trip we took to Cannon Beach overnight, couple nights. And then up in the uh, right corner there, this was a hike that I led a couple years ago, and this was everybody on the hike. But we started talking, and it was really funny. Every single person in that picture is from a different country. And so we jokingly called that our United Nations Hiking Club. So we're divided into five sectors geographically across the city, and we have programs in all of the 26 community centers that Seattle Parks and Recreation has. So that's just a diagram about who we serve. So Northeast includes Lake City, Laurelhurst, 
Community Center, the Magnuson Brig, Meadowbrook Community Center, Northgate, and Ravenna Eckstein Community Center. Southeast, you can see the community centers listed there, Central, I won't go through it all. But we basically have one staff person for each of those sectors, and that staff person manages the programs, plans the programs, and a lot of times participates in the things that go on um, in each of those community centers for the people 50 and over. I see people shaking their heads because I don't think they can read the names of the community centers. So in Northwest, we have Ballard, Bitter Lake, Green Lake, Loyal Heights, and Magnolia. Southwest, which is West Seattle, Alki, Del Ridge, Hiawatha, High Point, South Park. Central is Belltown, Garfield, International District, Chinatown, Miller, Montlake, and Queen Anne. And the southeast is Jefferson, Rainier, Rainier Beach, Van Asselt, and Yesler Community Center. So that's a lot of buildings that we're programming out of. And a lot of you might not even know if that was your neighborhood that there was a community center there. And that's, we laughingly joke about our program that we're the best kept secret in Seattle. So we have a lot going on. And I did bring some brochures. I didn't drop them at the front desk, but I'll make sure they get out there as soon as we're done talking. Can I add? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that um, we offer about over about 1,050 different programs a year, and we have about 12,000 registered participants, and then um, we, ha we serve about 87,000 people with including drop-in programs, trips, and classes. So we have many fitness programs, like Brenda said, we have serve a 50-year population. So we provide programs that are high, at, high level of activity down to things that are like chair aerobics and things like that for people with um, chronic pain. But this is some of our fitness programs. Um, that's Zumba, and this is a yoga class. Um, I'm not sure what that is. I think it could be Tai Chi. And there's a chair exercise class. And then we also do trips. We have four wheelchair accessible vans, very much like the Metro Access vans. Uh, we have, um, in each sector, they have two or three pickup spots. So as long as you can get to one of the pickup spots for our trips, you can get, get on the trip and go. You do have to sign up in advance. They're real popular and they fill up really quickly. Um, that was a snowshoeing trip in the middle. And this is a trip to one of the farms in the fall. Uh, believe it or not, we took a group and we went uh, zip lining. That's one of my very favorite pictures there on, on your far left. And then this was a hike that we did. Um, I can't remember where that was, but that was really fun. And also another hike. We love to get outside. And um, I had a man who hiked with me until he was 89 years old. Um, probably for about 11 years, I met him. He was a kaji old engineer and real gruff, and he just really warmed up. He didn't want anybody to help him, but there towards the end, he always, his favorite thing was being out in nature, and because we're able to go on the trips with the people, he got so he would walk with me. We would go about two blocks, and then he would find a rock to sit on and then walk back with me, but I think that he said that that was what made his life worthwhile was still going out in nature, so that was really a nice, nice thing. We have arts programming. We use a lot of our facilities that are not community centers, like the um, Japanese Garden, the Volunteer Park Conservatory. We have a reader's theater group. These are people who've been actors in the past and people who always wanted to be an actor. Maybe it was on their bucket list. And twice a year, they um, produce a play, all volunteers, the director volunteers, and they um, put that play on at five um, retirement homes a year. So if you guys want to be on the list, if you live at Mirabella, if you want our Reader's Theater group to come out, let us know. We'll come out and do a performance here for you. Um, social activities, really important to stay engaged socially. So these are so, some of the things that we do on the far left is a trip to Jazz Alley where the, the uh, restaurant makes lunch for free for everybody. They provide entertainment. It's just a really great event. We usually get almost 100 people out at that. Um, we have a volunteer who 
leads a walk for people who have dogs or people who love dogs. So that's our walks with dog group and they meet um, every other Tuesday. And this was a special event, bingo, but we can't ever do bingo, just plain old bingo. We have a drag queen that does bingo for us, so. <laughs> we also do a lot of environmental programs. We have the environmental learning centers with Seattle Parks and Recreation at Discovery Park, Camp Long, Carkeek Park. So we partner with them to do environmental education programs. And these are some of our trips and environmental programs that we went on over the years. And this is our Sound Steps program, but I'm not gonna talk the whole time, so I'm gonna give the microphone back to Brenda. So this is, um, I talked to you earlier about how we have a culmination where um, people train for several months and then they do a half marathon. This is actually a photograph of the beginning of that half marathon um, after they did a lot of stretching at Gasworks Park. And then you can see them walking across the Fremont Bridge. And then this is the end. And the woman with her arms up in the air, that's Betty, who's 97. Full disclosure, I think she was only 95 in that picture. <laughs> Time passes quickly when you're having fun. So this is our food and fitness program. The photograph on the left shows our Korean program. The program in the middle shows our Vietnamese program. Oh, other way around. Sorry, I can't see from here. And then the photograph on the right is our East African program. And they're now starting to teach cooking classes at Yesler Community Center, and I was able to participate in the first one. I don't know when I've chopped so much garlic in my entire life, but it was fabulous food. So that's a great gift to our community. Do you want to talk about it? Oh, too late. What? Sorry, I pushed the button. Okay. This is our um, photographs from our Dementia Friendly Recreation Program. The photo on the left is intergenerational. Every year for a day they go to um, Yesler Community Center and work with a group called Silver Kite Productions. And this is a an international, intergenerational session with the day camp that day where they were dancing. They had a fabulous time. And um, they do painting classes and their artwork is amazing. They did a talent showcase at Northgate Community Center a few weeks ago. And I went to the very first one that they did back in 2011 and then this last month and their art is just incredible. It's so beautiful and very expressive. Um, but they do singing, improv, um, a lot of artwork, drum circles, and every year we have a whole day together at Camp Long, which we call Camp Momentia. And we take play, do drumming circles there and art. Um, we go for scavenger hunts and then we end up outside at the end um, making s'mores on, with a campfire and sing campfire songs. <laughs> it's really fun. <coughs> this is Rainbow Recreation and this is pretty funny. This is a nice story. We did a Mardi Gras celebration this year at Miller Community Center. And we had it advertised, and we had only, I think, five people sign up. And Cheryl was like, Brenda, I think we have to cancel this program. Only five people have signed up, and we have all this planning and decorations. So we went on nextdoor.com and advertised it. Well, what do you know? Over 50 people showed up. And a lot of them had never heard of our programs before. But we had a really great time, and... On the left, you'll see a peacock on stilts who was feeding one of our advisory council members a snake. Um, it was a piece of red licorice. Um, and then this is just a photograph of the staff who were supporting the event, but we sure had a good time. You might recognize the person on the right in the lower left. That's Sarah Demas, who Age Friendly Seattle stole from us a couple months <laughs> ago. But she was instrumental. I don't know where she is now. Oh, back, back in the back. She was instrumental in um, starting the LGBTQ program that we started in, we launched in September. So expect great things from Age Friendly Seattle. Yeah. 
We also could not, simply could not um, run the number of programs that we do without our volunteers. And we have several volunteer opportunities. Um, one is driving our vans. Um, as you may know um, from what we've told you, we go all over the city and the state and the county exploring everything we can find that's fun and interesting. And we're always looking for drivers for those vans. We also do uh, some reg restoration work. We do volunteer opportunities at food banks. Um, the photograph on the right hand side, lower right hand side is a quilting group from Queen Anne and they in the past have also donated some of the, the quilts that they have made. So come play with us. We really want you to, and this is the staff um, of our program, and so you can see it's a small group of us that serve uh, thousands of people, but we sure have a good time doing it. So thank you very much for having us out today. Appreciate it. We, um, I did bring some brochures for our summer program. Registration for summer starts May 22nd. We're still in our spring program. So you could grab a brochure if you're interested in signing up. You could also go to the Parks Department website, www.seattle.gov slash parks slash seniors. And community centers, any community center. They yeah. can register. Yes, and any community center you can register. Or you can call us and we'll help you. The last part of our program is about you. And if you've got questions, uh, if you've got comments, um, I will try to answer these questions for you. Or I will direct, if I can't answer, I will get your name and information. We have roving microphones around. I also have a couple of staff members, Brian Chu, who is our professional pho photographer. He actually is a professional photographer, and I was lucky enough to get him to join my staff about, well, what, nine months ago now. Um, and Sophia, who is back here, Sophia is our um, intern from the University of Washington, um, studying, getting her master's in public health. So it's great if you've got specific questions. So the first question that I received on a card was, why is it that the city of Seattle's capital programs are always over budget? Um, I, I have no good answer for that to cover every single project, but I can tell you that a few years ago I insisted upon doing what we call a dashboard for every department. So if there's a specific project, you can go, like just to look up our Seattle Department of Transportation under SDOT. There are line items for the programs. We also have a, what was a, like a, a colored risk management um, analysis on each one. You can see, is the program on time with a green color? Um, is it slowed down for some reason? Or is there a risk that we are addressing? So that's true about SDOT, about parks. Those are two of our uh, really capital, um, capital. What am, what's my next word I'm looking for? Intensive um, program. So you can check those out. I mean, everybody knows about the WashDOT project that was Bertha and the tunnel. It started off being, you know, as, assumed that it was going to cost $2 billion to do. Um, Bertha got stuck, thank God. When it got stuck, was it a point where it could still be reached? Uh, it was three years delayed, but good news for the city is that it is going to open early. Um, we're still, of course, fighting and we'll probably fight for years about who is responsible for that? Because the city's saying it certainly is not us. You know, we gave you everything we knew. You had, you the engineers and the designers knew what was down there, what the soil conditions were, but it was way complicated. Um, the particular piece of equipment that was purchased turned out not to be strong enough that they had to go in, as you know, dig down 160 feet, take off the front, take it up, re remanufacture it, put it back together. And once it got going again, it never stopped. But the complications that we are facing with projects like that are myriad. Um, but I do not have a good answer about why every project is over budget. Um, but as I say, those resources are available so you know where we are. Okay, do you, um, can we do um, I have a questions? question? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, just a comment. Any project you do, if you're a Harry homemaker, and is it always takes longer and costs more than you ever expected, no matter what it is. But that isn't my question. My question is, the person who was talking about transportation, getting around Seattle, maybe you have some influence. 
Daddy in Fairview is a perfect example of the bus, uh, the, the crosswalk not being long enough for people who can't walk as fast. The signal, signal timing? The signal timing. Good. First, at first there was no timing and then we complained and they, so they put up this thing so you have 15 seconds left. But they never extended the time and that's what's really necessary when you're a main crosswalk right next to a senior facility. Great, thank, thank you very much for that. And I will tell you, I will definitely look into that and we can get some things done. Um, a couple of years ago, out at Northgate, where we have put in the new Homestead Park, right across the street to the east is a, um, I can't remember what the name of it is, but it's a, sen a, a senior center, retirement center. And we actually got that signal um, increase to 60, 60 seconds. Now, it's not at a corner, which makes a difference, um, but these things can be done. So thank you for bringing that specific. Those are the kinds of things that if I know about, I can hammer home. So thanks, thanks for that. Yes, sir. My question is, who actually sets up the pedestrian access around construction sites? Does the builder or the cities? And who monitors, who yeah. monitors them? Because a lot of times, you're sort of stuck. You keep crossing the street where there's another detour sign. You right. go back and forth. It's a really good question. I think you heard it, but he's asking who's responsible when you've got a construction site. Um, it's actually on the contractor to do it right, but SDOT has people that are monitoring. Theoretically, they're monitoring closely. I can tell you immediately across the street from my condominium, Skanska is putting up what's called Two and U. It's Second and University Street building. And for a period of time, three sides of that were shut off. So people had to go across the street. And then, I mean, like you were saying, you walk down a block and you cross the street, and you walk down a block and you cross the street. Um, and it's maddening if you're trying to get someplace fast. I acknowledge that. Uh, the contractors pay a bundle for the privilege of doing this. It goes back into the general fund and uh, in the SDOT department budgets. Um, that said, I wish I could give you a complete and perfect answer. As a bike rider and a pedestrian, it frustrates the socks off me. So um, just know if you've got a complaint, you can complain to SDOT about it. Um, if you don't get a response, call my office. Good. Yes, ma'am. I think it's very interesting at the corner of Third and Pike, the ramps for handicapped and such are sitting angled at the corners, not straight onto the crosswalks. So it looks like it was designed to do uh, always at once oh, traffic. Good point. And why don't they do it? It's a busy corner. Yeah. Um, so you are now moving me beyond my expertise, but that never stops me. I can give you my, my opinion, but I will tell you it's my opinion. Um, what I think that these four-way, um, what they call scrambles, are really effective at many points, and, and we see it down on First Avenue, which is where I live, but they won't do it on every street, and I ask them, why is that? Um, and they've got signal timing issues and a bunch of other things. But the other concern I have, and you brought this up, is if you are using a walker or, um, and I think many of you know that my husband has muscular dystrophy, and as things are um, progressing in his disease, uh, walking is more and more difficult. So I am really sensitive to sidewalks, to the crossing, to the ramps, um, and like you were saying about the signal timing. I mean, it freaks me out to be walking across Alaskan Way with him, and we're seven seconds into it, and it starts flashing. You know, because we're about a third of the way across at that, at that first seven seconds. Um, I do not know the answer about Third and Pike, and it's Pike or Pine that you said? Pike. Third and Pike. But um, would you make sure, uh, Sophia, could you get um, this lady's uh, contact information? We'll look it up and somebody will get back to you. Thank you. Good. You bet. Yes. I moved into Seattle approximately seven years ago from the east side. And my impression of the city council in Seattle is one that is totally out of touch and totally out of control. It seems all they want to do is spend money and tax people. And this latest idea of $500 head tax, which is going to kill the, the goose that lays the golden eggs, i.e. Amazon, is just absolutely crazy. 
I, I tell Tom O'Brien to wake up. Message received. Hi, I'm Dolores Rossman, and for years, my husband and I walked the Myrtle Edwards Park, and um, we came to realize, as we get older, how important it is to have public bathrooms. That's one example. When we had the bridge that went across from Lower Queen Anne, um, and Mayor McGinn um, was there for the dedication, I told him, we need a bathroom between one end to another. And this is an issue that really is, addresses social and civic engagement because a lot of older adults do want to be involved, but they may not feel comfortable going out because there is a lack of public bathrooms, and I know there's issues there, but it's something that's really going to be uh, needed even more and more right. as we get older. Good. Thank you for bringing that up. And uh, I think if you heard the question, she's saying, we need more public restrooms, and I could not agree more. A number of years ago, I went to Portland and looked at a program they've got called the Portland Loos. Have ever, any of you heard of these? It's really quite fantastic. Um, they don't cost as much as you might think. Um, Portland's got, I believe, about 10 of them up. And the way they do it is they build them in, like in curb bulbs, so they're very visible. And the design is cool. You can see if there's people in there. All, all of the business parts are covered, right? Um, and you can wash your hands on the outside so you don't have water on the inside, which keeps things a little bit cleaner. Um, and I have looked in this, I have put money in the budget over the last few years to multiply those. We've got a couple of them now um, at the south end at Genesee Park. We have uh, one going in at Ballard, one going in in the University District. and. You won't believe this, but I have worked for seven years to try to get a bathroom down at Occidental Park. And we worked with the Pioneer Square Alliance. And first they wanted one, and then they didn't. And then people really wanted a different kind, and then they didn't. Um, last year, I went down to San Francisco to see a program that they've got, which is they're self-cleaning toilets, but they're monitored. And that's a difference from what we tried about a decade ago. And by monitored, I'm saying it's a brilliant strategy um, I believe it is um, a nonprofit that's run by the Episcopal Church, and they hire people who are returning to San Francisco after being in prison. So these individuals get a job. They have a manager that, you know, it's on the other end of the, ra the radio, and their job is to make sure that the restrooms are used properly, that people aren't going in and doing things that they shouldn't do and we wouldn't want them to do. But they've got 13 or 14 of those around San Francisco, and I'm like, and have asked this question and pounded the table to both SDOT and Seattle Public Utilities, why not? Why are we not doing this? Um, and just like you're saying, um, but another uh, aspect of age-friendly that I've really appreciated, and this is something that John and I have talked about at Mo Market to Mohai as a pilot, and that is to talk to some of the businesses along the way that would put, hey, it's age-friendly here, come right on in. And that means you can use the restroom. So, um, the answer is yes, you are absolutely right, and um, just know that um, I see it as a top priority. The question has to do with some of the finances, and, and say three to four years ago, you had a basic budget that showed income and it showed expenses, I'm sure. A very basic, simple thing that all businesses produce. Can you provide that in a three years ago and, and current today? Uh, can, Be I, I because can't. it is my belief yeah. that the revenue coming into Seattle as a result of all of the new construction and the taxes at the current tax base that you are getting should far exceed what new expenses you've incurred over those three-year periods. The second point that I want to make is the atrocious presentation our city has to the people coming into here from the east side through I-90. The tents that are there the trash that is there is just horrible. In addition to that, underneath the freeway by the convention center, that stuff is accumulated after you have moved at one time. Why can't you simply tell these people that there is no place for your tent in the public grounds of Seattle? Yeah, Why? well, um, let me tell you that, again, th this is my ninth year on the council. What you just put your finger on is the single most frustrating thing that I have had to deal with. 
And right now we're dealing with, with it again, like you were talking about with the head tax. The irresponsibility of charging 600 businesses a huge dollar amount to pay when we cannot say number one thing is get those tents off the street and keep them off the street. So over the years, our, I mean, I'm talking four years now, and this is coming back to your question. Four years ago, I believe that our human services budget for this kind of work was something like $34 million. Still an astonishing amount of money, and that doesn't count the Office of Housing money that we're putting into low-income housing. It is double that now. And people say to me, how in the world can you spend that much money and we don't see something better? For what it's worth, um, in my, the meeting before I was here, I was meeting with a bunch of our human services providers and laid that out to them. And these are the folks that are saying, we need to get the $75 million more so that we can address this human service crisis. I'm like, if you cannot guarantee me that you will stand up with me and get the tents off the streets first and get those people into a safe and secure spot, I'm not supporting this thing. I'm not supporting an amendment to it. I am not supporting it. And it's because we've got to care for people. We cannot simply keep doing this thing over and over again. But that said, we don't have spaces. I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah, it's okay. If, if you, if it's take, not, take the microphone. If a drunk doesn't want to be cured, he's going to be a drunk. Yeah. If the people don't want to improve their way of life and to move up the economic scale, providing them with, with more expensive housing isn't going to cure the problem. Yeah. The city has to come up, or the people have to come up, with a solution to encourage these people to move on with upward on the yeah. economic scale. Yeah. And you haven't done that. Well, I would beg to differ, Mr. Cook, but we can talk about this afterward. We haven't been as successful as we would like. That's absolutely true. Uh, but the number of programs that are in place, the number of mental health um, and behavioral health projects that are trying to get to those folks, um, the numbers are increasing. But you know, I share your frustration. It's about all I can say at this point. Yeah. Thanks for coming today. Yeah, um, my name is Denise and I'm a social worker at one of the senior centers. And I have a question since we're bringing up homelessness. Is will the Age Friendly Seattle plan address the housing crisis that's now affecting older adults? Uh, will Age Friendly? Age, it's part of, as you saw, this, the eight domains, mm -hmm. making sure that we've got housing for everyone across the economic spectrum. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely a part of it. Mm -hmm. Will we be able to solve it? Um, I am at this point uh, reluctant to ever say that these problems are going to be solved. Mm -hmm. It's a continuum, um, and we can do better. We can add more. But as long as people are coming into, this, into Seattle at numbers faster than we're able to build housing, um, it's not going to be solved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that there are, what we're not seeing are people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s who are being, uh, you know, they can't live in their house anymore, they can't live in there, and there's so much shame and guilt behind that that they are not speaking up and they're not speaking out. Mm -hmm. And so having low, low income, affordable housing for older adults um, is really, really important as to what we're seeing within the communities. Right, and I would say um, as a, a step in the right direction, the shag housing, which is the senior, senior housing, but it's not anywhere near enough. And you're, you're shaking your head, so uh, give me, do you have a solution? Do you have something that you would like to recommend? Because I'm all ears, that's why we're here. You know, I think it's looking at other communities, and again, when we talk about working with older people, People who are being housed out need shelter, and shelter that's appropriate for older adults. For instance, if you are homeless, you cannot get up off the floor where homeless people are asked to sleep. We have people who are in shelters who have to be out by seven, eight o'clock. So it's providing a wraparound shelter service that's specifically for older adults. And what I'm seeing as a social worker, it's older women. Who, have, have, who don't have the resources and haven't had a chance to build that up over time. So I, I, it's systematic. Right. You know, you can't just come at it from one perspective. It has to become, you, we need to change systems, we need to change taxes, we need to do so many different things. You know, it's just not a one solution. And shaking my head with Shag, it's a great um, idea, but they now are not 
building. I, most of the adults that I work with, older adults who are in limited income, cannot even afford a shag housing. <clears throat> you know, there's that gap. And so maybe it's policy that closes some of those gaps. And I'd love to talk to you about it. If Great. One of the things that I um, continue to puzzle about is we charge developers uh, a chunk of money in order to, to help offset uh, or be able to build affordable um, in low-income housing. Um, but we don't expect the developers to integrate it within their own, in their own development. So, for example, I would love to see in South Lake Union a requirement that rather than the city getting money that it feels like you never see the solution to, that in these big, huge towers with a thousand apartments, that some of those at least are designated as affordable for the people that work in South Lake Union so that you start solving some of the transportation issues and really the struggles people have when they're on close to close to or at minimum wage. Yeah. That's a really good question, Ruth. If you heard her question, it's like, why do we not insist that developers include low income or affordable housing in the new developments we're seeing? So right now we give them an option. Um, we require either a certain amount of units that they will include or they mitigate by paying into the Office of Housing Fund. The Office of Housing, it's, it's interesting to me that virtually every neighborhood I go to say, no, we want those units to stay here. Um, and using an example in Uptown, which I really respect, uh, they've got something that's called the K site, which is right across the street from actually from um, the new Opera Center. Uh, there's going to be an entire building there that's going to be low-income and affordable units, and then there will be others right next door that are included. But interestingly enough, the Office of Housing says to me, we are reluctant to insist that developers put units in because we can actually get more units by leveraging that money. Many, many of you have heard about the 4% tax, federal tax credit, the 9% federal tax credit. So if that money comes to the C city of Seattle, if our Office of Housing matches it, then the developer gets a tax credit. It, they claim, they claim, the Office of Housing claims that they're able to triple the amount of units as contrasted to just saying to the new buildings across the street, you have to have X number of units in. But that said, I'm really looking at that and evaluating what other cities have done, and Boston is a big example of where they've said, nope, you have to. As part of the permit for you building in our city, you have to include low-income units. Now, interestingly enough, that provides or pre uh, presents another problem for us, and I heard about this in New York City, that they did something like that, some of the big units going in. They ended up putting in two doors. I hated that. It was called the poor door. So if you were in low income, then you went into the, through the poor door. You know, you didn't walk through like the rest of us walking into Mirabella. So I will tell you that it's complex, but it's not insurmountable. But thank you for asking that question. Oh, hey, by the way, third act, I was going to just recognize you. Thank you so much for, for coming, and one of your writers is here, and so we can talk afterwards about next steps. But please, tell us about third act. Oh, hi, I'm Victoria. I'm the publisher of Third Act Magazine. And first of all, I just want to compliment everybody who's here today who's on the front lines of working to make life better for older adults. Um, you're doing incredible work. I've, I've had the opportunity to, to we interviewed some of you and worked with some of you, and I'm just so impressed. So well, thank, thank you, thank you for thank the work that you're doing, and Sally, you. for your advocacy for older adults. You know, um, one of the things that, that I've discovered since I've started doing the magazine and, and stepped into this world is we talk a lot about ageism. So I have a comment. And interestingly enough, how we as older adults tend to exacerbate it. And one of the ways that we exacerbate it is by talking about age restriction in housing. So um, I don't know if we've ever really thought about it, but the only um, legally sanctioned uh, discrimination against age <laughs> happens in communities that allow um, only people of a certain age and older. So, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. So um, from a city standpoint, um, a recommendation I have, I think we're on the, the right um, track when you're talking about universal design. And the beauty of universal design is carrying that through into affordable housing is that you don't create housing just for older adults. You create housing for affordable housing for all adults. So that, that, that helps the workers that um, um, are in the beginnings of their career and lower wage workers. That helps older adults as well. And it also integrates um, uh, it creates an intergenerational community, which is healthy for everyone. Because older adults, I mean, we all like hanging out with younger people too, right? And we wonder why sometimes that younger people or younger generations look at us as, um, what I've read re uh, recently, as being needy and greedy. Okay, needy for services, but greedy because we are taking a lot of perceived um, assets um, out of our way for perhaps future generations, when a lot of that isn't true. So I would be a real advocate, Sally, of looking at intergenerational affordable housing and universal design. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for that comment. Um, I appreciate where you're going, Victoria. The universal design is something like you I have been advocating for for years and just realizing that it isn't just for seniors, it's for every one of us. Good, I, I, I see we've got time for one more question. Happy to take it and then we'll end this on time. Yes. Um, we live in Belltown and I appreciate all the improvements that have been made, but one of the things that I've observed is that the community center in Belltown doesn't seem to be open very many hours of the day. And it's a resource that the city has invested a great deal of money in. Um, and there are several, uh, bill, I mean, the Belltown uh, population is becoming more intergenerational, not just all of us empty nesters. But there are also several buildings in um, Belltown that have supported housing or uh, financially supported housing. And it seems like that community center could be a good way to outreach that community um, and even having something as an event like this at the community center would be I think very helpful. Well, thanks for letting me know about that. I'm there many many times um, at that community center. I just think it's so important and so valuable. The unfortunate part about that is that um, Parks had a short-term lease on it too so it's not going to continue on that site. Um, I just since you're in Belltown le let me ask you this question. Do you tell me what you think about this? So um, as the Battery Street Tunnel is filled as part of the, uh, the work that's going on with Bertha, there is a site that's two acres at First and Battery. And uh, the Seattle Public Schools have approached us at the possibility of building an elementary school there. Um, and I'm like a huge advocate of that concept of having spaces for people. Um, but on top of that building, because it's, it's so far um, it's a, such a gradient, gradient difference between Western uh, First Avenue and Battery that after the tunnel's opened, after WashDOT does its staging, that is a potential site, two acres that could be for an elementary school plus a park plus possibly affordable housing on top. Um, your thoughts? Well, that sounds great, but why not add a community center Absolutely. there? Absolutely. You yeah. know, make it no. multi-purpose. Absolutely. And you draw the community together mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's it solves several problems. No, you're right. I mean, I, I mean I, it offers amenities for many things, yeah. and it, it really makes it it really makes it a real resource to the community. Right. I mean, it would be great to have a school in the community where people could volunteer and yeah. you know so forth. So having all of those opportunities in that one setting would be wonderful. Yeah, I failed to mention we're talking about three floors of a community center. So sorry about that. Elementary school, community center, affordable housing, like teachers' housing. How about that? Wouldn't that be great? Okay, well, I want to say thank you all, all for coming, for your paying attention, um, for being involved and engaged and caring. And once again, love Mirabella. Really appreciate all of you. So thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>